Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. A long list of crime cases are creating a backlog in Bear County. What county leaders are saying now about cutting it down. Plus, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's a drama bowl? Yes, in the front yard of a home. You're going to hear from the homeowner and find out why she's not the only person this has happened to. But first, there are two shootings that we want to tell you about tonight. Let's go to the one on Deerwood Drive on the north side. Police are saying that two masked suspects shot a person several times just before 6 o'clock this evening. And by the time police got there, the suspects were gone. The victim was rushed to the hospital but later died. And then there's the other shooting. Chief Willie McManus says that one of his officers shot a woman near the medical center just before 6 o'clock this evening. The chief told KSAT that the woman was waving around a gun and then pointed it at officers. And that's when officers say they fired at her. She was hit, rushed to a nearby hospital. We don't know her name or how she's doing tonight. The officers involved in this, they weren't hurt. They're going to be on administrative leave while this incident is investigated, which is protocol. Right now, there is evidence at the Bear County Crime Lab that hasn't been touched for over a year. The night team's John Paul Vidal has talked to the lab's director to find out what's being done to catch up. We're getting in between six to 700 cases a month right now. Uh, so, you know, the goal is obviously we have to be working with, you know, be able to work what's coming in plus more than that to eat away at the backlog. There's more than 4,500 drug, gun, and DNA cases with evidence sitting at the Bear County Crime Lab that are still waiting to be analyzed, according to the Crime Lab Director, Oren Dim. Some cases dating back to June of 2023. What do you say to people who might feel that this backlog will affect them or a loved one who is going through the justice system? There's all ways of mechanisms in our criminal justice system to address those situations where the delay in the crime lab is denying people their justice. And that's the reason why I put the foot to the pedal, so to speak. Bear County Judge Peter Sakai and county officials have allocated portions of the county budget multiple times this year to fill four positions at the lab, as well as allow lab personnel to work overtime. One of my operational goals with the discipline is by February 2025, right, that's coming up, we should not have anything on our roster from 2023. Dim explains the lab has made strides in cutting into the backlog of more serious cases. He says in the past year, they've reduced the backlog of sexual assault cases by 72%. But the majority of the backlog now is related to drugs. The trend we've been seeing in the past year and a half that's interesting is the percentage of marijuana cases being submitted uh, has tripled. As the lab continues to cut into their caseload, Jetsakai tells us he wants to continue to work with them and their needs to ensure no case is compromised. I have to be respectful of those uh, lab technicians and our uh, people that do the la uh, crime analysis in that crime lab, that they are doing thorough and quality work. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio leaders have passed a nearly $4 billion budget. It includes cuts and fee increases, but the city's property tax rate, that's going to stay the same. The unanimously approved plan is nearly 6% bigger than last year's budget. It includes more money to hire 65 new police officers, 15 new firefighters, and 14 more animal care service officers to help handle what the city is calling critical calls. Homeless camp cleanups are also accounted for in the budget, and the city is aiming to target 1,300 homeless encampments over the next fiscal year. A good chunk of the budget is also going to be covering street maintenance. $122 million is going to go straight into that. Also something that we focus here on, uh, on here at KSAT is a new fire and paramedic contract for the first time in 15 years. San Antonio and the city's fire union have agreed to a new contract. The new three-year deal is going to increase increase pay for firefighters by 21 percent over the next three years. It's a lot of stuff to go through when we're talking about four billion dollars. It's a lot of money. If you want to take a closer look at the budget, what's covered, what isn't, we have an article about it on our website, ksat.com. In February of 2023, 81-year-old Ramon Najera and his wife were attacked by loose dogs on a west side street. Najera died later that day. Tomorrow, 
The owners of those dogs are going to find out how long they'll be behind bars for that attack. Christian Moreno and Abilene Schneider pleaded guilty, and they're going to be sentenced tomorrow afternoon. We're going to cover that live on KSAT.com starting at 1.30. A new report is showing something disturbing about Texas moms, and it turns out that more of them died because of pregnancy or childbirth between 2020 and 2021. This information is coming from the Texas Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee. According to researchers, the maternal mortality rate was 17.2 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2019. But the following year, look at that number. It was 27.7 women who died for every 100,000 live births. And then in 2021, that number went up again to 37.7. That's the most the state has seen since it began tracking maternal deaths back in 2013. And researchers are saying that COVID is only part of that story because yes, some of the mothers did die from the virus, but even when they removed those cases, the numbers were still higher than they were before COVID. Four days ago, that happened. You remember those pictures, a car drove into a gas line outside of Houston, sending a tunnel of flames right into the sky. And today, the fire finally di died down enough to allow crews to tow that car away from that fire. Investigators in Deer Park, Texas, found human remains in that vehicle, but it could be a while before they know who it is. They still don't know why that pipeline was hit. The hundreds of people that had to evacuate their homes because of that fire were finally allowed back into their homes late yesterday. And here's a live look outside with our live cam. If you didn't see it earlier, right around sunset, the sky was just lit up beautifully from remnant clouds from a few showers. I'll share some of those photos that were posted to KSAC Connect, even some nice rainbows out there. We did get in on a few isolated showers. I'll focus in on which neighborhood really got most of the rain. 97 was our high temperature today. It's going to be very similar with that somewhat tropical feel because of the humidity. That will change a little bit in the days ahead. We'll get into that along with potential tropical development in just a bit. Adam, thank you. It might be seven months away, but it's never too early to start thinking about Fiesta. The five finalists for next year's poster were, were unveiled tonight at the San Antonio Garden Center. Each artist got a canvas and also time to make their case to the Fiesta Commission about why their art should be the one that's picked. It's a blank canvas. Just do whatever you want to do and get the spirit of Fiesta. Fiesta for all is the theme, but have all of San Antonio. Incorporate all parts of the city and all different events in your, in your art. Are you excited for this? I know we have to do Muertos Fest first, but the Fiesta Commission is going to cast their votes, their votes on the posters tonight, but we're not going to have those results until January. Fiesta 2025 starts April 24th, and it's going to run through May 4th. Cameras have revolutionized home security. You know, you can see everything that happens around your home. So for people in St. Hedwig, you know, that does include the occasional rogue bovine right there in the yard. The night team Zaria Oates went to St. Hedwig to find out how these people feel about their brand new neighbor. Caught on camera, this bull made a middle of the night appearance in several St. Hedwig front yards. As soon as I pull it up, I'm like, babe, there's a cow <laughs> in the front yard. The unexpected visitor turned out to be a Brahma bull. Gentry moved into her quiet St. Hedwig home in June, around the same time as many of her neighbors. Jerome, did you see? And she's like, we had a visitor. He ate my plants. And when I came back and looked, because I saw a few leaves on the ground, but when I seen the whole thing had been chomped up, I was like, oh, who's got beef? The jokes are never ending when livestock comes right to your front porch, but it's a problem people in St. Hedwig say didn't start until multiple new housing developments popped up. Many of these St. Hedwig neighborhoods weren't built until after the pandemic. This was their land, you know, they built on all of this farmer land, so I mean, they came from somewhere like we kind of I feel like we took their area. <laughs> the bull also prompted a question about insurance that none of them thought about before. How would I explain it to if I had to go to like State Farm and I'm like, guys, a bull busted through my house and all I had was a uh, like fire warranty. Neighbors say they aren't too worried about the bull's appearance, but they do hope ranchers are able to keep their animals close by, saying it's a price they're willing to pay 
or the peace that comes with living in the area. Take a cow eating up my, my grass over like random city dangers. Zaria Oates, KSAT, 12 News. I guess that's the trade-off, right? Coming up, it's a persistent issue that neighbors say they're tired of dealing with, and that is illegal dumping along Quintana Road. And we focus on that very issue earlier tonight in our latest episode of Know My Neighborhood. Coming up, we're going to walk through the problem with neighbors who want something done. Plus, heat kills. You know this, a breakdown of the data right here in San Antonio. You're going to see who's most hurt by our hot summers. A few hours ago, we wrapped up our latest episode of Know My Neighborhood in South San. And like every neighborhood, it has its problems. In South San, that includes hundreds of tires and piles of trash dumped along Quintana Road. And neighbors see a lot of that. But that's why you can hardly see the greenery in some areas while that's happening. And it's gotten worse. The night team's Avery Everett shows us why that road is considered to be one of the most extreme illegal dumping sites in the entire city. It's bad. It really is bad. A walk down the street can't be peaceful for Patrick Garcia. This whole section is tires and trash. Because the sidewalks around his property are buried under debris. How often do you see piles like this on your property? Well, this is nothing. I know you said you found dead animals before in the piles. Oh, dogs and cats. Years of photos show illegal dumping in South San is a problem. And it's one Garcia is tired of dealing with. Yeah, you know, I spent time sweeping the street myself. It's costing me money. And he's not alone. It's just ridiculous. We care about the land that we live near. Toys, tires, and piles of trash. This is the reality for residents living in this neighborhood. And that's because of the big problem that illegal dumping has become. And the city says it cleans here every week. If this is one of the worst dumping sites, put lights, and, ha and the city has resources to put cameras, and I think that would put a big stop to this mess. The city says it struggles to enforce illegal dumping laws because you have to catch someone in the act. One sign sits outside Garcia's property. You can barely read it anymore. Oh yeah, it's been, yeah. That's the only warning label that we've seen. That's right, that's it. The city says with the new budget cycle, it's looking at options for new signage and surveillance. But neighbors say a solution can't come soon enough. You have to zigzag through the items because they practically throw them on the, on the street. We're tired of this. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. Yeah, nobody wants to see that in their neighborhood. You know, that's just one of the several stories that we highlighted on tonight's Know My Neighborhood episode. They also talked a lot about pride. You can find more stories about South Sand on our website, KSAT.com. We invite you to watch the entire episode. And we do know, yes, definitely hot outside, but new data shows that climate change is hurting us more than ever. UTSA looked at 20 years of CDC data on heat-related illnesses. The study found a 117% increase in heat-related deaths in the U.S. from 1999 to 2023. I don't think you can deny that there's something going on there. There's a pattern of increasing risk of, of heat, we know that. We know that the environment's getting warmer. We know that there's more extreme hot days. And so that, you know, my interpretation of the data is that that is then leading to these increased number of deaths. Here's the stat that scared me. More than 21,000 people have died from heat-related illnesses since 1999. And more Americans died from the heat in 2023 than any other year during that time. And those most impacted are people who work outside, children, the elderly, and the unhoused. And the humidity certainly does not help with the heat. Yeah, the humidity makes it a lot worse. Actually, the heat and humidity combined today to make it feel like 106. That was our heat index value again this afternoon. Just look at our dew points. They're well into the 70s. Very, very sticky. The tropical air that's in place. Now, tomorrow's going to be similar. 97 again for the high temperature. When you factor in the humidity, it's going to feel like it's around 104 to maybe even 105. Now, afternoon dew points during the hottest part of the day will fall off a little bit into the weekend and early next week, and that will help to mitigate the feels like temperature a little bit, especially early next week when air temperatures actually drop into the lower 90s. It's Thursday, the new drought monitor, it's in, and most of San Antonio in drought. 
yet again. And it does stretch, of course, into the hill country and westward all the way to the Rio Grande. Obviously, we need more rain. And you look across the state and parts of North Texas, right along the Red River, falling deeper into drought. It's getting worse there and even West Texas as well. Situation still getting a little worse and not getting better. Now, earlier today, we did have a few little tropical pop up showers in the afternoon. That was mainly south and east of San Antonio, but you actually get into Bear County here and on the northeast side of town between Windcrest, Converse, down toward Kirby, we had a nice little downpour that flared up, dropping a little over half an inch of rain in parts of this area. So the northeast Bear County and just within 1604 and around 410 there, Windcrest down toward Kirby and Converse, we actually had a decent little accumulation. Here's actually a picture posted to KSAC Connect of the rain. You see those big, fat, tropical raindrops? You can see them nicely there. And it did set the stage for some beautiful photos and rainbows. See the rain shaft off in the distance. This is from Alamo Stadium as the teams were warming up and double rainbow just right across the sky. And ooh, the sky was on fire with the leftover clouds. At sunset, there was a nice 30 minute window to really uh, view the beautiful display at sunset. Upper level heat high still working its way overhead. It's going to be the dominant feature for several more days, but it will break down and move eastward as we get into early next week. In turn, we're going to trim a few degrees off those high temperatures, but we don't really have any good disturbances to move in. Nothing of consequence. In turn, our rain chances are still fairly low on the low end. Now I do want to point out farther north in Texas and even West Texas could get in on some rain. They need it too. I showed you that in the drought monitor just around here. Slim pickings a 10% chance here and there, and that's about it. Notice the east coast of the US up and down the entire east coast. That could be the sweet spot for the rain. As I mentioned, a 10% chance here and there, especially early next week around here. As for the tropics, we're watching a few areas. Slight chance of development way out in the Atlantic. Two areas we're watching, but also the Western Caribbean. 40% chance of development there in the next 7 to 14 days, and then that could move into the Gulf of Mexico. Tomorrow morning, we're in the 70s, very humid. By noon, we're already 90 degrees, and then 4 or 5 o'clock, we're at 97, but it's going to feel like it's about 104 to 105. Well into the 90s, it looks like an August temperature map there uh, for tomorrow. And then, by the way, the autumnal equinox, Sunday at 744 a.m., if only it would feel like autumn as well. Unfortunately, it won't. Oh, and I'm looking at the temperatures there for tomorrow. 97 degrees. I feel bad for the kiddos playing football. I do too, and our photographers are going to yes. be out there. That's why we give them water and Gatorade to go because mm -hmm. we want to keep them hydrated, right? Hey, tonight we had, what, I think about nine games in the area. We were able to get the three of them, including Brendan and Harlan, plus Julian Champigny. We sat down with him the other day, and one of the topics that came up, his twin brother. We got it coming up. Top 10 matchup at Ferris Stadium tonight between the ninth ranked Brennan Bears and the seventh ranked Harlan Hawks, who were coming off of a bye week. First quarter, Hawks QB Aldrick Trotter rolls out and he throws, but his pass is intercepted by the Bears' Jalen Garner, and Brennan is about to capitalize on that turnover. Moments later, the handoff goes to Makai Thompson, and he's making a house call 37 yards to the end zone. Brennan leads 7 to nothing, and this District 28 6 a opener goes to Brennan 51 14. The Wagner Thunderbirds were host Thunderbirds were hosting second ranked Piper in a district 13 5 a D1 opener for both sides. First quarter, the Thunderbirds strike first. The handoff goes to number 11, Sonny Serrano, and he does the rest. He sheds off a defender, then he stays in bounds, and that play is sunny side up. 49 yard touchdown for Wagner as they go up seven zip. It was 14 0 Wagner when our foe talk left in the final from Rutledge. Piper comes back to win 35 21. At Orem Stadium, third ranked Alamo Heights was hosting Clemens for one 
one last primer before district. Mules opening possession ends in a touchdown. Junior DK Garza cuts up the middle. No one's stopping him. Clemens blocks the PAT, and that brings us to the Buffalo's first drive. Down six, Spencer Mann connects with Christian Dupree downfield, and Clemens scored on the next play. It only took two passes for the Buffaloes to find pay dirt. However, the Mules have blocked the PA team, return it to the house for two points. Alamo Heights wins at 38-19. The Mules improved to 4-0. and And other scores tonight, you have Medina Valley over Burbank, 21-19. Harlandale edge Jefferson by one, 20-19. John Jay won a low-scoring game against Southwest Legacy by a final of 9-3. Blanco shut out Ingram Moore, 35-zip. Kennedy over San Antonio Compass Rose Legacy, 62-0. And Laredo Nexon beats Southside by a final of 28 21. With Spurs Media Day coming up, we were able to sit down with Spurs small forward Julian Champigny beforehand to give him some love ahead of the season. Julian is a 3 and D guy and a key member of the Spurs roster. Plus, he's got a twin brother, Justin, that he loves with all his heart. We've been twins for 23 years. <laughs> uh, nah, but we, you know, it's, that's my dog right there. He's a, he's a, we're splitting images of each other. I don't know if anybody could, could tell, but a lot of times people will see us and they can't tell the difference. Like if you don't, if you don't know me, you won't know the difference between me and him if we're standing next to you. Um, but he's a good dude. He's a cool dude. He's a hard worker. Uh, he's in Washington right now yeah. on a two way. I'm um, hoping he gets, you know, a little deal, get his, get his thing going. Um, but yeah, he's the hardest worker I know. So he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a good dude. Good dude right there. How competitive were you two growing up? Uh, man. Real competitive. Like, comp like it's, it's, it's weird because it's not, it's not like a competitiveness between me and say KJ or, or Harrison or, or, you know, somebody that's in this gym. It's more of a, it's a deeper competitiveness. Like we're like to the bone, like I'm, I'm going to beat you at this. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of times I used to lose when we would play basketball and stuff. So it, it, it gets pretty, it gets pretty intense. Julian had a very special summer for many reasons, and the best moment came when he popped the question. I got engaged to my girlfriend of uh, four years. Okay. I've known her since middle school. Wow. So I've known her for about 11, 12 years now. Okay. Um, fun fact, we dated in middle school for a little <laughs> while, a little while, a little while. But um, no, nah, but that's, that's my road dog right there. She comes with me everywhere. Um, you know, she's, she holds the fort down while I go out and do you know, what I got to do. And I really appreciate her for that. I do this okay. and she handles okay. just about everything else outside of this. So the house, the, all my travel when I'm not, gotcha. when I'm not with the team. Okay. Uh, she, I haven't washed clothes in four years. She packs my bags. <laughs> she, she, did, she did everything for me. I tell her all the time, if I, if I didn't have her around, I, I wouldn't be able to stay in the house we stay in because I couldn't keep up with it. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> And I'd have my clothes. I don't know. I don't know where I'd be right now. Yeah. Well, very cool. Congratulations. <laughs> I appreciate you. All right. Arch Manning gets the nod and Shohei goes off after the break. Texas redshirt freshman Arch Manning will start a quarterback when the Horns host UL Monroe this Saturday. Head coach Steve Sarkeesian announced today. He said Quinn Ewers, who's coming back from an ab strain, is making progress, but Sark wants him to heal up even more before they start SEC play. Hey, L.A. Dodgers Shohei Otani had a monster game today. He went six for six with three home runs, two doubles, a single, ten runs batted in, four runs scored, and two stolen bases. Plus, he became the first big leaguer to reach the 50-50 club. 50 homers and 50 stolen bases in the same season. And the Dodgers beat the Marlins 20 to 4. All right, thank you for that. Yep. We'll be right back. All right, get ready. It's almost time for this year's Head for the Cure 5K. It's on September 28th at Providence Catholic School across the KSAT Studios downtown. KSAT supports Head for the Cure in honor of our former news director, Jim Boyle, who died of brain cancer. All the money from that event goes to brain cancer research. If you want more information, visit ksatcommunity.com. Adam. All right, tomorrow's going to be a lot like today and really a lot like the past couple of days. 97, the high temperature. That's going to be a common number, but it's going to feel like we're up to about 104, 105 when you factor in the humidity. Just slight 10% rain chances here and there. That's about it. Mm. All right, we'll get through this together. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you tomorrow.